Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and this is a continuation of a series of videos regarding the Russo-Ukrainian War and its applications to a variety of microeconomic models. Um, in a previous video that will be linked in the top right corner, uh, we looked at an article regarding the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war and its impact on wheat commodity prices. And with that, we also saw the impact of uh, rising wheat prices on um, other uh, commodities produced by farmers that can generate wheat, such as cotton, uh, rapeseed, soybeans, and so forth. And so uh, in that top right corner, I'll put a link to that video where we're, we could see the applications of the competitive supply model. And I'm going to continue to use this in this video. I had some great questions from my students yesterday. And we'll see the links between perfect competition um, and competitive supply. So that's going to be the purpose of this video. So the link to this article will be in the video notes below. And it's a great article from the beginning of the Russian-Ukrainian War, more or less, March of 2022, uh, highlighting the vulnerability of the Egyptian population to rising wheat prices and how Egypt is very dependent on imports from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the article, as you scroll down, it, it highlights uh, Egypt's dependency on Ukraine and the quantity of imports they get, as well as their imports from Russia and due to sanctions on Russia and uh, the, the, the inability of Ukraine to uh, initially get their wheat out of port and through the Black Sea during the war, uh, really placed Egypt in a vulnerable position due to the high price of Egypt due to the reduced global supply. And the article you know, highlights that. Here we see that dramatic increase in the price of wheat. Um, for those who have studied elasticity, we know that the demand and supply curves for commodities are very inelastic. So any shift leads to a very uh, large change in price versus the change in the quantity. And further below in the article, which I have here, it highlights this. And this is a great uh, paragraph that really emphasizes this application of the theor theoretical concept of competitive supply. Here it's looking at Egypt and seeing where can they potentially get uh, their wheat? What are the regions of the world could they get their wheat? Is there a possibility of an increase in global supply of wheat? Uh, and due to length of time, not really. Um, and also, it highlights here in this paragraph below that because of the rising wheat prices due to the reduced global supply, because wheat competes with crops such as maize, soybeans, rapeseed, and cotton, then we would expect a reduction in the supply of these commodities, which would also lead to a rise in its price. And that's exactly what we see. So here we see over a five-year period, uh, here, the impact of the Russian-Ukraine war, increasing the price of wheat, and that will incentivize farmers to increase their quantity of supply while reducing their supply of corn. And the reduction in the supply of corn will lead to a rise in the price of corn that we see here. It will lead to also a reduction in the supply of soybeans because it competes with wheat. The soybean prices will increase Rapseed price is also increasing due to the reduction in supply uh, because it competes with wheat and cotton as well. All right. Um, so that's what we're going to graph by using perfect competition and competitive su supply models to understand what's happening with these commodity prices. So let's go ahead and graph this. Okay. So here I have uh, perfect competition and competitive supply. We're going to be looking at wheat versus soybeans and the impact of the Russian-Ukrainian war on commodity markets. Graph A is the industry or the global wheat market. Graph B is the firm or an individual wheat farmer. And for now, graph C will be the firm, an individual soybean farmer. And a farmer that can produce wheat maybe is also producing soybeans. Um, and so we'll apply some competitive supply components here. So first, let's go ahead and graph uh, the industry. So we have the global supply. Or I'll make it relatively inelastic for 
wheat, so supply equals to the marginal cost. And we have a downward global demand curve for wheat in the global industry. Here's our downward sloping demand, also relatively inelastic, equal to our marginal benefit. And that sets the equilibrium global market price at point A, let's say. So I'll label that price at P1 and quantity supply and demand at Q1 in graph A for the global industry for wheat. So here we have Q1 and here we have P1. And this price will be the perfectly elastic price that all farmers worldwide must accept as we learn in perfect competition. All right, so I'll just make a little dotted line highlighting that the price set by the industry becomes the perfectly elastic price that all farmers must accept for wheat. Okay, so that will be again, the price of P1. And since farmers are price takers, that'll be their price. And here it's price is equal to the average revenue which is equal to the marginal revenue. I don't have much space there for that, but I'll you know, just say it's equal to the marginal revenue, equal to the marginal benefit, et cetera. And then we're gonna have our upward sloping supply curve for the individual farmer. It has, due to the law of diminishing marginal returns, it slopes downward, then it slopes upward. I'm gonna label this S3, equal to the marginal cost. And then we'll add our average total cost. We're going to assume that this firm is in the uh, long run equilibrium of normal profit. So I will use perhaps another color. Let's use uh, let's use green. And here is the average total cost, ATC. Here we are. Label that ATC. And here we are at this other point A, B, I'll label this point C for now. And that will set also the quantity of output for the individual farmer. And I'll label that uh, Q3. Okay, so this is our starting point. If you've studied perfect competition, here we have the individual firm and we see with the individual firm, they're going to profit maximize and profit maximization, the rule for maximizing profit is producing where the marginal revenue curve equals the marginal cost curve. And so here we see that's MR, the perfectly elastic demand curve. AR is also equal to demand, equal to marginal revenue, equal to marginal benefit. And the supply curve is equal to our marginal cost of production. So we're MC equals MR, that's at point C. So at point C, We see that the farmer is maximizing profit where MR equals MC. And in addition, we see that they're generating normal profit because at point C, we see that the average revenue is equal to the average total cost, the cost of all explicit and implicit um, costs of production. So here we are. So that's our starting point. And due to the Russian-Ukrainian war, we have a reduction in the supply. So supply, there's a supply shock, reduced supply of wheat going into the global market by Ukraine and Russia. So we'll draw S2 over here. S2, it sets a new equilibrium at this point. That explains the rise in the price of wheat that we saw in the uh, trading economics website for wheat prices. And so that leads to a reduced quantity supply and demanded to Q2. As a result of an increase in uh, a decrease in supply and that leads us to a rise in the price to P2. Okay, so the Russian Ukrainian war has led to reduced supplies of wheat from S2 to S1, setting a new equilibrium at point B. That leads to an increase in the price from P1 to P2, and a decrease in quantity supply from Q1 to Q2. This becomes the perfectly elastic price 
that the individual farmer must accept worldwide. So let's just adjust this a little bit. So I'll have ATC continuing. For a little bit further up. So here we have ATC and the individual farmer accepting this higher price. Okay, so here we have P2 coming across all the way to this point. All right, and this will become the price that all farmers worldwide must accept since they are price takers. Individual farmers do not control that price. So here we have P2. And P2 over here equal to our demand curve equal to AR, et cetera, and equal to MR, et cetera, okay? Um, again, the firm wants to profit maximize where MR equals MC. So they will follow their supply curve from point C to point D. Here is where MC equals MR. That's where they're gonna maximize their profit. And that will set their quantity supplied increasing from Q3 to Q4. And then we can illustrate the profit that's being generated, the abnormal profit that's being generated by individual farmers worldwide. All right, and then we will shade that area in so we can clearly see. So this rectangular area illustrates the abnormal profit that's being generated by the individual farmer. We can see that for the farmer in graph B, at a quantity supplied of Q4, the average revenue at P2 is greater than the average total costs at, and I'll label this point, C1. Thus, the farmer is making super normal profit. Now we can uh, discuss competitive supply. So with competitive supply, we're focused on the individual farmer and they can produce wheat or soybeans on their farm. So I'm going to emphasize that we're just looking at the supply curve of S3. All right, when we graph this, we're just illustrating the supply curve and how they're increasing their, their supply, their quantity supply from Q3 to Q4 as a result of the increase in price due to the uh, industry setting that higher price. So in a previous models or previous videos, we have shown that you can have an individual farmer, let's say this is their farm, This is their plot of farm, and maybe half of their farm is allocated towards wheat, and the other half towards uh, soybeans. Okay, maybe 50% of their land is allocated towards wheat production, and 50% of their land is allocated towards uh, soybean production. As the price rises from P1 to P2, we learn in competitive supply that the farmer is incentivized to allocate more of their land resources to produce wheat because there's more profit to be made. So let's say that now the farmer reduces their soybean production to 25% and allocates 75% of their land towards wheat production. So here we have more wheat being produced. 75% we're gonna say, and less soybeans. 25%. So if we had the supply curve drawn for soybeans, it will have we'll label this S4. And let's say that the price of soybeans was approximately here. And the quantity supplied at this point. So here we have uh, P1, P2, I'll say this is P3. 
and quantity supplied Q3, Q4, I'll label this Q5. A, B, C, and this is point D, and we'll label this point E. So holding price cost at P3, if farmers worldwide are allocating more land resources towards wheat as a result of the higher price, they're going to reduce their supply of soybeans in this case. So supply decreases from S4 to S5. From point E to point F at this point. Reducing the quantity supplied from Q5 to Q6. Okay, so we see that reduction in supply. So if you just look at point graph B and C, graph B is just illustrating the supply curve and graph C is just illustrating the supply curves. It's just like the models that we've looked at for competitive supply. So here is wheat, and in this case, rapeseed, the reduction in the supply. So you see the same concept here in graph B and graph C. Now, what's missing? Why is the price of soybeans increasing, right? We looked at wheat prices rising due to the reduced global supply and farmers increasing the quantity supply along their farms and allocating more land towards wheat production, but reducing their supply of corn, that would lead to a rising price, reducing their supply of soybeans, reducing their supply of rapeseed, reducing the supply of corn, uh, cotton. So if they're reducing their supply, the price is rising. Why? What we're missing here in graph C is the demand curve. So if we were to illustrate the demand curve, put in demand here, D1, D2, I'll label this D3, if we add that demand curve, we see that in the short run, price is held constant, but due to the quantity demanded at Q5, quantity demanded at Q5 is greater than the quantities being supplied. That means there's excess demand. So it's gonna put upward pressure on price and price is gonna rise for soybeans. So it's gonna to increase to a price of P4. And due to that higher price, we'll see farmers increasing their quantity supplied along their reduced supply curve of S5. And we'll see uh, consumers of soybeans reducing the quantity of their demand along the demand curve from D3 to uh, from point E to point EFG. And there we go. We have finished drawing this. So this could be a potentially interesting uh, series of models perhaps in an internal assessment, or perhaps in a paper two type of exam or in a, a real world example used in paper one. Now I'm gonna go ahead and analyze these three models as I would for a paper exam. As can be seen, we're illustrating concepts of perfect competition and competitive, competitive supply. With competitive supply, we're seeing the links between wheat and soybeans. The applied real world example is the impact of the Russian Ukraine war and its impact on commodity markets for wheat and soybeans. In graph A, we're illustrating the industry or the global wheat market. In graph B, we're looking at the firm or an individual wheat farmer. On the y-axis, we're measuring price costs revenue. On the x-axis, we're measuring quantity supplied and demanded. In graph A, I have two upward sloping supply curves according to law of supply labeled S1, S2. The PES value for primary commodities is less than one due to length of time, the time it takes to uh, produce crops, time to plant, uh, let the uh, seeds grow and harvest it. And then we also have an inelastic demand curve that's downward sloping labeled D1 equal to the marginal benefit. PED would also be less than one because let's say it's a firm demanding wheat to produce bread. There's no substitute for wheat. So it's a very inelastic demand curve. In uh, graph B, we have an upward sloping supply curve labeled S3 according to the law of supply, a perfectly elastic demand curve uh, labeled D1 or P1, which is equal to AR1, equal to MR1, equal to MB1. That perfectly elastic demand curve is set by the price set by the industry. 
and we see where the S3 curve intersects the ATC curve. It intersects at its lowest point, indicating productive efficiency. So let's begin. Uh, graph A, we have an initial price set at P1 and initial quantity supplied and demanded at Q1, where S1 equals D1 at point A. The industry sets the price that all firms must accept, which becomes a perfectly elastic price. Again, P1 equal to demand, equal to AR1, equal to the marginal revenue one, equal to the marginal benefit. Assuming that the firm is trying to maximize profit, they'll produce where MR equals MC. That occurs at point C, setting the quantity of output at Q3. At Q3, we see that the firm is generating normal profit because AR equals ATC. Then, as a result of the Russian-Ukrainian war, there's disruptions in the global supply of wheat. So supplies of wheat are reduced from S1 to S2. That sets a new intersection where S2 equals D1 at point B, increasing the price of wheat from P1 to P2, reducing the global quantity supply and demand from Q1 to Q2. That becomes a perfectly elastic price that all firms must accept in graph B at P2, equal to demand 2, equal to AR2, equal to MR2, equal to MB2. Assuming profit maximization, the farmer will increase the quantity supply from point C to point D to maximize their profits. At point D or at Q4, farmers increase their quantity supply from Q3 to Q4. We see that at Q4, average revenue of P2 is greater than average total cost of C1. Thus, farmers are generating normal profit. Now, how does this link to competitive supply? Since the farmer let's assume that half of their farm was being allocated towards wheat production and the other half towards soybean production. Due to the higher price of wheat, the farmer will allocate more land towards wheat production and less towards soybeans. So let's assume that now the farmer is allocating 75% of their land towards wheat and only 25% of their land towards soybeans. That will lead to a reduced supply by these farmers of soybeans, as we can see in graph C, from S4 to S5. Holding the price constant at P3, we'll see a reduced quantity supplied by farmers from Q5 to Q6 along their new supply curve of S5. But um, we see that at P3, the quantity demanded for soybeans at Q5 is greater than the quantity supplied for soybeans at Q6. That would put upward pressure on price to rise from P3 to P4 for soybeans. As a result, that will increase the quantity supplied along the S5 curves from point F to G or from Q6 to Q7. And that will lead to a reduction in the quantity demanded from point E to G or from Q5 to Q7. All right. So as a result, we can see that as a result of a decrease in the global supply of wheat and that causing an increase in price, individual farmers worldwide will respond by increasing their quantity supply, which means that they will reduce their supply of the competing goods that they grow on their farms, like soybeans. That reduction in the supply, in this case of soybeans, would also lead to a rise in price. Again, if we look at the data, we see the rise in the wheat prices leads to reduced supplies of corn, which increases their price, leading to reduced supplies of soybeans, also increasing their price, reduced supplies of rapeseed, increasing their price, and reducing the uh, supply of cotton, also increasing, increasing their price. Okay? So that is the goal of this video. Perhaps and in the next video, I'll look at what happens in the long run with uh, the higher price of soybeans and how that would lead to increased supplies of wheat and also increased supplies of soybeans, cotton, and so forth to bring the price back down. If you have any questions, feel free to comment and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.